Uh, real quick before I jump into this, um, raise your hand, uh, quick survey, if you use the internet. <laughs> okay, that's about everybody, except for you, sir. Um, welcome to the book spring. Uh, keep your hand up if you use a browser on the internet. Okay, keep your hand up if you use more than one browser. Okay, keep your hand up if you use more than one browser for security purposes. Okay, put your hand down. Put your hand up if you use one browser for just absolutely everything and you love it forever. I am going to try to convince you, sir, to change your ways. Um, hopefully I can make compelling arguments, but you need to judge that. Uh, I depend. I do believe that if you use your subreddit, I would be Then you are already up to speed. You're free to leave at any time. No. <laughs> Okay, um, let's dive in. My name is Toby. I use the internet. I use browsers. I use more than one browser, but not the way that you think. Um, quick disclaimer, uh, all of these thoughts and words are my own. Linux Best North Northwest does not endorse any of this. If you want to make changes to your browser, you're welcome to do so. Make backups. Test your backups before you actually throw out what used to work for you and switch to something that is completely, totally new. All of this should be stuff that is not completely crazy and off the wall, but it's going to be just a different way of looking at things. Before I get started, and even though I'm already sort of revving the engine here, uh, this talk is probably about two multi-tools out of five in terms of difficulty of implementation you should be comfortable admitting your own box. Um, and things like Shemod, or if you want to pronounce it Shemod, should not terrify you. Um, in terms of paranoia levels, I'm gonna give this about three tin foil hats at, oh, I'm sorry, that's a typo, that should say tin foil hats. Um, about three tin foil hats out of five. There's gonna be some Big Brother conspiracy stuff that I talk about. Um, negligible Illuminati mentions. Um, I'm not a crazy man, I'm just an average user uh, who's worried about his online safety. And that's it, I swear. <clears throat> so, let's start with the story. Um, this is posted to Twitter, and I'm not going to read absolutely every slide out loud, but I'm going to read this one. Why does incognito mode give me cheaper flights? It's 2019, haven't we passed this? Let's manipulate the customer using cookies phase. Raise your hand if you know that as you are tracking flights on your airline carrier websites, the airline carrier websites are watching and tracking you. Excellent. I was not expecting to see that many hands. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of this, if you are watching a flight, say you want to fly from Seattle to Chicago, and you keep going back to check to see if those flights uh, are going to get a little bit cheaper or a little bit more expensive down the road, there are advertising and tracking uh, bits of code that the website loads that say this person is really interested in going to Chicago from Seattle and they're not buying. How can we compel them to buy? And an algorithm runs and it says let's start bumping the price up a little bit so that they think that they've actually missed the sweet spot window and compel them to buy it at what is going to be more expensive than what the flight actually would cost for some other random person. Um, I, when I figured that out, I jogged the floor. Incognito mode, really good. Everyone should be using it, right? Um, another Twitter post. Here's a good article for the people asking if data anonymization techniques work in preserving anonymity. You, you would think that data anon anonymization would actually help keep you anonymous, but it actually doesn't if you have two different data sets generated by the same person and you can correlate them. To which Katie Mazuris replied, Anonymous, anonymized data set plus anonymized data set equals the anonymized data set. And it took a week to match 17% of users looking at the users generated two different uh, anonymized, uh, basically, traces that they had online. And it took 11 weeks to get to 95%. But if you included smartphone data, it only took less than a week to get to your 95% number. And that scared me. Finally, our buddy Brian Krebs, kind of in the news right now. We're not going to talk about what he's doing today. We're going to talk about what he was doing in February. He says, I do most of 
my media and story reading from a virtual machine. Brian Krebs is smart, usually. Sorry, but while I trust most of the publications I frequent to do their best to get the story right, I don't trust the 97 other sites from which they pull scripts and other random stuff. So Brian Krebs is probably one of the most wanted people online. Bad guys are constantly trying to get into his information because he's a reporter and a journalist who reports on what the bad guys are doing online. So he has to be careful. And I kind of want to be careful too. So here's my problem. I've got adware. We all have adware and trackers that are monitoring what we do online. And we've got cookies that track us and follow us around. And because airlines are changing the prices for you, just you, when you're looking for specific flights, they are going to try to manipulate what you do and what you see online. And personally, I think that's manip manipulating me in a bad way. And then different sites will get together and share it there. But really, it's your data to identify you. They know who you are and what you're interested in. They can more accurately target you and show you ads. So what I want is a way to maintain a clean browser slate. Men in black, you put the glasses on, shh, flash the little neuralizer, and the browser no longer remembers who I am, what I've done, or where I've been. And I want to be able to split my browsing activity into separate logical groups. Even though I'm still me, no matter what I'm doing, if I'm interested in travel, I want all of my travel stuff to look like one specific identity, one specific persona. And if I'm on Reddit looking up cookie recipes, I want that to be a completely different persona, and I don't want those two things coming together. we got to keep them separated. <laughs> Here's my goal. I want to avoid leaking data websites or between browser sessions and I also want to be able to limit the amount of data that can be collected by cookies and adware and trackers and I want the individual sites to only be able to see what I choose to show them. I don't want to be able to tip my cards to site A and have site B know what I'm doing over there. I'm going to assume that whatever company I'm dealing with, whatever website I'm on, is going to have a data breach at some point in the future. And I want to be able to limit the damage that will occur to me if and I assume when that happens. In other words, I want everything to be nice and separated. It's a fun uh, spectrum of individual bits and pieces. Not a giant Katamari Damashi ball of garbage that just sucks in and absorbs everything as I'm rolling down the internet, and you can never get rid of any of it. So I don't particularly want to focus on hiding my IP address. There are ways that you can do that, but this is outside the scope of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I'm not going to try to keep nation state actors away because they have millions of dollars to be able to focus on this and teams of and I don't have millions of dollars in this say. So I can try to limit my exposure to sites, but the NSA is just going to get whatever the NSA wants. And I'm also not going to teach you how to cheat on your wife or do something that your employer uh, doesn't want you to do and would get you fired. There was a disclaimer, that still applies. So incognito mode. Everyone uses incognito mode, right? It is the best thing in the whole wide world search for anything, and when you close the browser, it's gone forever. It's perfect. Everyone should be using incognito mode. It's the last word in online safety. Unless you read this article, um, great advertising for this talk that I didn't ask for last week, this name Slashdot. Uh, it's kind of hard to see because there's, well, there's this pop-up thing asking you to fill in your email address, and then they're saying, hey, we use cookies to track you so you can't really see it but if you disable javascript in your ad blocker this is what the article really says this won't keep your browsing private do this instead thanks fast company i had to shut off half the trackers that you were using to tell me that incognito mode won't help you with trackers and they say browser compartmentalization Car compartmentalization is a difficult word to say at 9 45 in the morning um, but this is what we're going to be talking about today. The Gruck, 
is a cool dude. He's a security researcher at the University of Thailand, and he wrote a medium article called Operational Security and the Real World. I'm just going to be synthesizing what the Baruch has been telling me online forever folks today. An important part of the operational security approach uh, is implementing compartmentation <laughs> or compartmentalization, I don't care which term you use, to limit the damage of any one penetration or compromise. Now he is talking about government entities, he is talking about secret operations where you have foreign spies stealing national secrets overseas, but it's also kind of applicable to me when I just want to book a flight on Alaska Air and not have them manipulate what I'm seeing. He says it's sometimes referred to, sometimes referred to as impact containment. By compartmenting your operations, the control center over your accounts, and the information available from any single persona source, limiting the impact of a compromise. In other words, you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. He says high value targets should be separated and have cleared your low value targets. We all have the important websites that we go to every day. We do financial transactions. And then we have our flash games that we play, and we shouldn't be doing that in the same browser. Email accounts should not be used for anything other than their purpose, and they should be separate from your personal account. Uh, proper compartmentation limits the damage made by compromise. Without it, attackers will leverage one in, uh, leverage information for one compromise account to access another account. This is called lateral movement. Um, one of the reasons why you don't use the same password on all boxes in your production fleet is because if one box gets compromised, all of your boxes get compromised. And he says, at a bare minimum, keep your business and your personal life and accounts separate. So to boil this down even further, it means don't use the same browser for your bank and your MMORPG. Don't reuse passwords. Everyone should not be reusing passwords. Uh, this was news to me. Don't reuse usernames. Raise your hand if you have had a stalker uh, follow you from one social media site to the other because you've been funky dude 22 since you were 15. I have had that happen to me. Uh, and don't reuse email addresses. Uh, email addresses are a perfect way to be able to identify someone because if you only ever use funky dude 22 at yahoo.com for everything, whenever that site shows up in a anonymized data set, they know who you are and what you've been doing. Compartmentation is key. In cognito mode, in private browsing, private window, in, uh, in Internet Explorer, and in Microsoft Edge, they are good technologies. They're not enough anymore. You want compartmentation. That's my, my de facto for the talk. You should be using a password manager, no matter what. You probably saw this article in Forbes in February that says that there are, uh, uh, so there's a security flaw in a number of top level, very popular security managers. Some people say, oh, maybe I shouldn't use a password manager. No, forget this. Acknowledge that it exists, but do not let this stop you using a password manager. You need to be able to have some sort of central piece of uh, software that says, I know when I go to this website what my credentials for that website are specific security flaw was about using a master password that stays in memory. In order for someone to be able to exploit that, they would expect that you need to be able to completely compromise your machine anyway. This is sort of a high-level uh, theoretical attack that is one of those things about how the NSA might be able to get your passwords, but I don't really care about the NSA. I care about companies that are actually out there trying to make it. Use a password manager, please, and they one of the ways that you can avoid this specific type of vulnerability is to use two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. 2FA or MFA is called a bunch of different things. It can be a hardware key. Uh, it can be an app on your phone. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and these are all really good password managers. If you're not using one of these, if you're using something else that you found, let me know. I'm certainly happy to add to this list. I have like KeyPass. KeyPass has extensions that allow you to set up uh, a hardware uh, security key, at, like YubiKeys, so that even if your master password gets compromised, the information that is in that password database still needs a physical key that I add and hit the button in order to be able to get to it. Uh, I also like Pass, the password store. It is not a utility in itself, it is a wrapper around GNU PG, the new privacy guard. If you don't trust what you're doing, 
privacy guard, you're probably a little more paranoid than even I am. Um, and password safe is nice. Uh, it actually has a symmetric encryption mode that is not fully documented, but it's great for being able to encrypt like the old time config files here and there. Just mentioned to me. Don't use the same email address. Even if you have a Gmail account, you can leverage multiple email addresses through Gmail. Um, not a lot of people know about this, but if you uh, use a plus sign, some other string of legitimate email uh, address characters, uh, they will still go to your Gmail account. And what you can do uh, is essentially filter on that. So you can turn one Gmail account, or more than one Gmail account, into a virtually unlimited number of Gmail accounts by adding plus Alaska Airlines. And you say, hey, Alaska Airlines, I'm creating an account with you. My, my email address is named plus Alaska if you get any email from someone who is not Alaska Airlines to that Alaska Airlines email account, even though this is not your Gmail account, your Gmail account is just name, you'll know where that specific email address was obtained from the person. Uh, another cool thing that you can do is you can legislate random string numbers or letters in front of your thing, uh, and that obfuscates the ability for me to be able to fish you. Um, if I know you have a PayPal account and you're doing this, uh, I can essentially send you a uh, forged mail with, I know your name, I know you have a PayPal account at gmail.com, and I can effectively say, I know you're doing this, here, I'm listening to PayPal. If I don't know exactly what that secret token is, that's different for every email account, it's much, much harder now for me to be able to send you email and pretend to be someone else. When that email account eventually gets spammed or compromised or whatever, you can basically add one to that and keep right on going. This is not a Gmail thing. Uh, this was added to Postfix in 2014. If you run your own mail server software, add email address extensions are probably there. I know it's been in Qmail for ever, since 1976. Uh, 1996. Uh, for the two people who use Postfix, yes. It is a literal plus sign. Um, that specific feature is in Postfix, and if you run your own Postfix installation, you can change what that character is, but Gmail uses the default. They've completely retooled Postfix. It's its own thing now. It's GSMTP, pretty sure. Uh, and they use the default. It is a plus sign. So, this is mostly a browser talk, and I haven't been talking too much about browsers. How do you secure software that you yourself did not write? same way you secure everything else. Uh, a lot of you probably already know about Docker. This is not going to be a talk about Docker. I don't actually like Docker, but I do like a lot of the designs in Docker. Docker is a containerization software. Essentially, you can throw anything that you want into what's called a Docker file. Uh, it builds a Docker image, and then that Docker image will effectively run the same way no matter where you put it. That's an incredibly oversimplified explanation for what Docker is. But Docker is probably the most famous right now and popular use of uh, software containers. And we're going to be talking about compartmentation and containerization. Uh, containers are not just Docker images. The general generic term for being able to isolate resources. We care about them. We want to isolate resources at some level. And also at the effect of persona. Sizes of containers can come in. A lot of people will argue over what is and is not a container. I'm going to go on the, the far end of the spectrum and say anything can be a container. If you look at it the right way, it can be a cheroot, it can be a FreeBSD jail, it can be a Solaris zone, it can be a VM, it can be something else entirely. What it does is it will take one or more processes and it will put it into a unique environment with its own rules. And that's really nice for being able to snapshot things and to throw things in. I'm not going to talk about FreeBSD jails. Uh, Michael Lucas wrote the Infinity EO and all book about that that was just very recently published. You all will be able to buy it uh, online, and there's a hardcover version is right there. I will be talking about the concept of jails, but I will not be talking about jails specifically. Uh, 
TLDR version of this is that Docker, in order to be able to do what it does, uses two Linux concepts. One is called namespaces and one is called control groups. There is a talk about this in 115 that I have done in 1045. I would recommend you check it out. I'm going to check it out. I have been approved. The long and short of it is that namespaces will give a process a private view of what the system tells it exists and that C groups restrict what it can do with those resources. So a really simple analogy for this is think of a hotel. A namespace, a Linux namespace, will say to you, hey, our hotel has a lobby, an elevator, and the sixth floor. Uh, there's, there's no gym, there's no breakfast nook, there's no complimentary anything. And then the C groups will say, well, you can only use the elevator between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. and you're not allowed to order room service. Make sense? There's another uh, set of system calls that you can use here, SecCom uh, for Linux. Um, I'm not going to mention Capscom. Capscom is a free thing that's supported to Linux. Uh, it's the same basic idea, and OpenBSD has a pledge, which are two different ways that developers can use to restrict what the process can do by basically saying, I know what this program is supposed to be able to do, and I am going to tell you up front, I need to be able to access the final system menu. And this and this open files, closed files, this and that. Everything else I don't need to be able to do. If the program ever gets compromised or tries to step outside of those bounds, it gets automatically killed because um, uh, the kernel has said, no, you said you didn't want to do that. Now you're asking for permission, something's wrong, you die now. So, securing system calls. There's a lot of different process restricted that are available. There's C groups, namespaces, user namespaces, uh, possible. Root. What your root does is essentially says, I'm going to take part of my file system and then tell it that's the root of the file system. This is one of the core concepts behind these details. Um, and if you've ever installed Linux by hand, the old fashioned way, you can just sort of extract a bunch of packages into slash MMT or slash target and then your root can do it to compile the kernel or whatever. That's the technology. You can get the set of resource limits if you're on a PSD. Pledge, and you can unveil. There's a lot of things that developers can do in the open source world in order to be able to secure their application. But I'm not a developer. I'm just a dude with some browsers and I want to be safe online. So what do I do? There's virtual machines. This is what Brian Krebs does. It's great. There's lots of different platforms out here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Folks, you probably already know this by now. If you don't, learn about virtual machines. VMware is virtual box. Beehive hyper Windows thing, but let's face it, we're all using Windows and some of them in our lives. And it emulates all of our hardware in software, which is great. We've got virtual CPU, we've got virtual memory, virtual storage, a new file system on it, and virtual network cards, virtual this, and now you have to log into the machine and run patches on it all the time. So you're basically running an entirely separate second and third and end box. It's really resource intensive because you see RAM storing all the RAM of this virtualized machine, and there's no way for the host operating system to be able to say, oh, well, let's be smart about how I'm using the resources here. You can just carve out with a very sharp knife all the resources of the machine to be able to say, make another tiny, smaller machine that's just not as good at doing anything. It's slower because I'm emulating it. It's, it's got really good security values. VMs are a valid way to be able to browse safely. Not saying don't use VMs. They're great. Use them if you want to. You have to. But it's really high overhead. What if I just want to read slash dot and hacker new at the same time? We're Linux users. We can leverage fire jail. Now fire jail is not proper jailing the way that FreeBSD jails are, but it's really cool. It's a user configured open restrict your running environment when you have an untrusted application. I consider the browser to be an untrusted application. So every program, when you started in the fire jail sandbox, or the jail, fire jail jail, uh, it thinks it's pin one. It doesn't see anything else on your system outside of whatever the first thing was that you instantiated from inside of fire jail. And it was designed with browsers in mind, which is why I'm talking about it here. Useful. You can just essentially there are a number of Linux 
Linux uh, installation package that said you can compile it and source it for And you're saying, hey, here's a big Firefox, and you're off to the races. It runs a set UID. If you know what that means, you know what that means. Uh, be careful, essentially, this process can pretend to be a user on the box. So it's got some sharp edges. Uh, but it allows you to take complex namespace configurations that typically only a developer would be able to uh, use to describe the container, uh, and it allows you to use it fine. So real quick, we all have software that we just want to be able to run on the local machine. And some of the phones home, we don't want the phone home. So what you do, um, you unplug your Ethernet cable from the back of the box, you run your program, and stuff you plug it So that's what I used to do. But you can essentially say, hey, fire jail, dash dash net equals none, run this program. And the program says, okay, I don't have internet access. Even though the entire rest of your machine is totally fine and you're SSH into it. Um, and you can use dash dash private. Fire jail dash dash private essentially says, I'm going to run this program and I'm going to create an entirely new temporary uh, home user directory. I think we all have relatives who just click on anything that pops up on their computer as soon as they see it without bothering to read it. And then they come to you and they say, uh, the, my machine is acting weird. You go, what happened? Oh, something popped up and I clicked it. You go, what was it? And then you have to filter through the 19 different uh, task bars and search bars that they've added onto their browser uh, because they like the purple gorilla. Dash dash drive is perfect for that. Uh, anything that they do gets thrown away as soon as Firefox works run that again, and you essentially get a brand new temporary right? It's kind of like everything is contained and compartmentalized. Um, it's incognito browser. Uh, the source code, the repository is on GitHub. It's GPLv2 license. We all love GPLv2 here. Um, the code is really easy to read, and it's easy to patch. Um, I'll say that again. It is easy for me to read and to patch. Uh, the developer removed a feature. Uh, the developer added the feature back in a few months later because there was probably not a cry to put it back in. But while it was gone, I took the latest version of the source code, the oldest version of the source code that had the feature that I wanted, and I said, oh, I see what it's doing. And I took that feature and I put it in the thing. I maintained my own separate repository. I'm not a developer. I've just said that several times. But I was able to do that because the code is actually really easy to uh, but it is Linux specific, and that's not a problem here, but we're not living in an all Linux world, so there's other ways to secure the browser, and Matthew Dillon had had enough one day. No, not, 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 not that Matt Dillon. Uh, this Matt Dillon. Uh, Matthew Dillon founded Dragonfly BSD. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Nice, nice. Uh, dra also, Dragonfly BSD is essentially a fork of FreeBSD. Matthew Dillon Developer. There are several, but he's really the rock star one uh, who made his own FreeBSD clone called the Dragonfly BSD. It got some really cool features to it that no other operating system really has or is compatible with, but that's a separate talk. Uh, back in the uh, 2015, uh, he had a problem with Firefox because browsers have bugs. And Firefox is no exception. There was a bug that allowed a malformed PDF to able to allow the attacker to be any accessible file on the machine. And that's a pretty bad <coughs> bug. Uh, so the bug got found and the bug got fixed. Matthew Dillon said, I don't care. Uh, I don't know how many more bugs just as bad as this or worse there are out in the world, so I want to be able to do something that will protect me that even though it may in fact impact my browser that I'm still using, I am protected from at least the impact of what that bug might provide. So you posted to uh, the Dragonfly user's mailing list, and you said, what I have done is segregate my browser use into user accounts separate from my main account. I created, wait a second. What I've done is segregate my browser use into user accounts separate from my main account. <laughs> this is when the light finally flipped on for me. You can run your browser as different users. Um, it sounds so, so simple in retrospect, but I hadn't been doing it for 25 years. 
Uh, he created three different accounts, one for secure Firefox use for his bank, one for unsecured use, and one for Chrome instance, which he uses for other things. Uh, and then he runs through how to do it. Make sure your main account is Jamod 700, which makes perfect sense to begin with. Make a new account, maybe .ssh on the you need to authorize this file. Make sure the ownership is fixed. This shouldn't be freaking anybody out. This is just normal user account creation. Once you've got that, you can SSH into it and say ls a to make sure that you do need to be running SSH on the box to be able to do this. And he says you should also have SSH set up for your main account so you don't have to type in a password every time you want to run your browser. Some people might want that so you can make sure you play as much as possible, uh, but you don't necessarily need that. And then he says you can just create a script that runs Firefox or Chrome through this SSH process. Um, here he's got in Firefox, it says scp.xoptility file, it's in that target meeting region. And then program the same, run set and display, only 0.0. .0. That just says, hey X, use the main X session. Uh, and then run Firefox. And then you can tie those scripts into your GUI, and he has, the, uh, he has a script called S Firefox for secure in case you didn't get that. U Firefox for we'll never know, uh, and Chrome for Chrome. So this method uses X11 and SSH, which I think everyone is familiar with. These aren't crazy new technologies. Uh, it's totally platform agnostic. I won't want to say totally platform agnostic is what we're going with this, but it works for Linux, it works for BSD, which are the two operating systems that we like to care about. Uh, but it does give side, uh, side accountable access to your X session. Uh, so do be aware of that and that's what's going on here because it's using X shared memory. You're not tunneling anything over SSH. You're just invoking that set and process, uh, that set and uh, environment here in your set of Firefox. Um, so you're not actually pushing data over SSH. It's all really quick. Uh, you're using X shared memory on the local box. Uh, but the security boundaries of the off are user permissions that are defined in your OS. You want those to be good. And if they're not, you have other problems. But if you have good security boundaries, which we've been using recently, we use them in the Dallas and it's great. Uh, but you won't be able to get your cat videos if you call Pulse Audio or much of also what you're using for that video to run. So the great thing here is it's compatible with Fire Jail. Let's run through another example. If I want to create a new browsing container, I can make a new SSH. I can create a new group called Firefox. I can add a system. Firefox group, home slash Firefox, home slash Firefox, and make a .ssh directory for the Firefox user. I move the new part of the event just to check with no password, because I'm going to see my path, but you can make the same chat in the system. I'm just going to authorize the fix the permission to the .ssh directory off of the authorized keys file. Authorize keys file in that directory. And then from there, I run the script. I define the first Firefox, I define the key. SCP with the key to the XOM authority file. Easy enough. And then from SSH, I ask that user to localhost set the display value at colon 0.0. I run DBUS launch exit the session with this DBUS system. This might be for other data. I send it down. Uh, and then user bin fire jail dash dash private dash colon equals dot so you send this to temporary threat. I'm trying to read the dot so well. Correct the software. And then just run user bin Firefox. Real quick, what about Windows? You can do compartmentation with Windows too. This is just coming out. It's called Windows Sandbox. It's going to be available in whatever the latest of uh, release that's coming out now. It's called a 1.19 update. Uh, it's a 2019 update. Uh, if you've got Windows 10 Pro or, or Enterprise, go 18.05 and up. And your machine is capable of running hyper v virtualization. This is not hyper. This is all the stuff. 
it's not going to create a VM, it's going to create some sort of weird hybrid VM where it uses your machine's resources and your machine's oper or operating system files, but it makes a, an editable copy of that. And it's super recursive looking. I'm running Windows 10 Enterprise here. I run Windows Sandbox, which is this little, little slide now. Not in the top, but it's a box, I guess, with this flat sand in it. Uh, and it's created a Windows 10 Pro inside of the uh, VM for me. I can install anything that I want from here, even though the builds are the same and the Pro and the Enterprise versions are different, I can do my browser through Windows Sandbox. Um, you can also use this utility called Sandboxy, or if you want to discuss Northwest, so I shouldn't be mentioning this. It's not free, it's not open source, but you're free to make the trial. Um, and I mention it because this is what I used before Windows Sandbox now. Uh, so you can define your user, uh, you can find Sandboxes, it will segregate into the files that you can download, and put it into a separate location. So if you download something, you can see cold flash my downloads directory inside a browser that's running the sandboxy, it won't be in your downloads directory. It's going to be off something else. And you say, no, I really do want that file where I said that I would. You go in and you manually program. When you're done doing whatever it is that you want, you can essentially keep the contents of that sandboxy sandbox and anything that is still in that sandbox. It works really well with portable browsers. So if you're browsing on Windows, I've got portable Firefox, and I say, OK, extract it over here. Change the home page, add the add uBlock origin, add HTTPS everywhere, do this, do that. Now I'm going to inside my sandbox and say, start an instance of that and go to Reddit, start an instance of that and go to AlaskaAirlines.com. And when it's all running out of one specific uh, portable directory, the changes that I make in the bookmarks and what have you, even if I want to keep them out for a couple of days or a week or a month, they go somewhere else. They don't change the actual. Uh, uh, base location for your Firefox portable Let's say you want to app uh, sandbox, but you're not happy with anything that I've said so far. You want to dial this up to 11. You can run Cubes OS. Uh, Cubes OS is a Linux distro that's built on top of the Zen hypervisor, and everything that runs on Cubes gets put into a security domain. Uh, all the applications are isolated into one security domain. So it's kind of a way of thinking app that you run is the virtual machine. The software that you're using in cubes is already running out of a virtualized process and you're just looking at the window. Don't think of it as a desktop OS even though it looks like that. What it is is an interactive GUI that shows you windows that are being generated by some of the apps and it looks just like this. Uh, here we have the apps that are running on uh, cubes OS and they are segregated into security domains according to trusted, untrusted, and between the traffic. There is more that you can do with compartmentation besides this uh, Finances are a big problem. We've got breached and cost of $22 million in class action settlement, which is about the In 2017, Equifax got breached. So this year, I'm expecting something bad to happen to transfer for it to get into the Buying things online is risky, and anonymizing money and financial transactions is hard. What do you think I'm going to say about spending and buying things online? Bitcoin. It's fantastic, right? It's completely anonymous money. No, this guy has already seen me run through this once. Don't use Bitcoin. Uh, no one accepts it, and it's not anonymous at all whatsoever. If you want to buy something online, use gift cards. Uh, it's widely available. You can get them in supermarkets. You can get them in office maxes and staples. It is fiat currency, and it's completely anonymous. They don't take your ID, and they don't emboss anything with your name on it when you buy an Applebee's gift card. Uh, but you don't want to only just buy things online from Applebee's, even though you can certainly have fun with as many uh, Applebee's as you want there. Uh, Visa and American Express are really good general purpose options for being able to buy a gift card. You can pay cash credit card, which is sort of a chicken and egg problem, but you can do it, uh, and each card has a low maximum value, typically around two or three hundred dollars. Sometimes you can get them for fifty, sometimes you can get them for five hundred, depends on the credit card you can get them for or not. Uh, but with a low maximum value, it also minimizes the advantage of that credit card number, and it's 
not really a credit card number, it's a gift card for when you punch it in online. It's a CC. When that credit card gets stolen, you're only going to be out $100 hundred to two hundred dollars, whatever amount is left on that, that gift card, as opposed to oh, your entire credit history. Yeah. I would not recommend that because I cannot see the question. But uh, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1970 helps with only if you use it. Don't use debit cards online. Debit cards are not the same as credit cards um, because they're not protected under the system they have. Congress in 1970 said. Wait a second, credit cards aren't really regulated that well. We should have it so that if you've got a credit card transaction that you want to dispute, you are not on the hook for what the cost of that transaction is once you've reported it uh, until your credit company actually figures out whether you're going to be charged or not. So something weird shows up on your bill that says you spent $1,600 in Florida and you've never been to Florida, you call up the, the credit card company, you say this wasn't me, you don't have to pay them $1,600. But you have to pick up the phone and call them and say this one. Uh, so it helps, but only it. So, uh, running out of time here, and I'm running out of slides. Uh, separate your high value and your low value activities. Uh, don't use the same browser for the bank as you do for screwing around with flash games online or trying to find uh, key gens and cracks on Russian TV servers. Limit the kind of damage you compromise with your marketization. Uh, using diversity of usernames, passwords, browsers, makes louder or possible for attackers so that if they get into one specific account of yours, they don't completely own and be online. Uh, and software can help, but the real compartmentation is an attitude you can have online. If you think about things as saying, what do I want to show to this website? Uh, and what do I want to not reveal to this particular website? And with that, thank you for your time. Uh, I have time for one, maybe two questions. Yes, sir. So, um, have I have not heard of Bitwarden. Uh, so I, I have no knowledge about it, but I will take a look at Bitwarden and I will take a look at privacy.org. Privacy.com. Privacy privacy yes. I use Firefox Focus as well, uh, which is great, but that's essentially super incognito mode, which does not help me keep the websites that I'm going to from learning more information about me. So I don't log into anything from Firefox Focus, but if I just want to look for, uh, hey, Wikipedia, where did the term come from? Firefox Focus is great for that, and also I use the DuckDuckGo app, where I'm just like, oh, maple syrup, it's my point W, and I'm done. Yeah. guy knows where it's at. Uh, Zen for Android, how do they find it? safe.